I would like to introduce your next speaker. He's a board certified pediatric dentist. He has master, a master's degree in human nutrition from Michigan State University, a dental degree from Loyola University, and did his postgraduate education in pediatrics at the University of Iowa. He has served on the teaching facilities at the University of Michigan, the University of Illinois, the Uni University of Chicago, and Rush Presbyterian Medical Center in the Michael Reese Hospital. He's currently completing prerequisite courses in biological anthropo anthropo I can't say the word. I can't say the word. Anthropology at Northeastern Illinois University to begin a graduate study in the, in the field of evolutionary medicine. His clinical focus is on prevention of oral and systemic disease through promotion of healthy breathing and eating. I think I need to breathe. <laughs> His primary wow. research is in the area of infant and early childhood feeding practice and how they impact the palatal facial development, Nash respiratory competence, and the nouveau cogn cognitive development. From my hometown, Chicago, please welcome Dr. Kevin Boyd. Sorry, I'm going to jump right into it because I'm going to need every single second of this. So, um, And I want to acknowledge uh, and thank Michael Gelb for not coming. Um, it's because of his, in a, you know, he had a conflict, so asked uh, if um, I could fill in for him, and they said yes, so here I am. Uh, and at first I thought, what am I doing at a meeting of toxicology? And, and then I went on the website this morning, and you're going to see how pertinent it is what I'm going to talk about. Um, that is Blue, Mighty Blue the Wonder Dog. Uh, and you don't need to have a service dog uh, training. If, if they're calm and collected, you can call them facility dogs. And there's some liability, but he's been there for nine years. People actually cancel their appointments uh, sometimes if he's not going to be there. Uh, he's got his own Facebook page. And, uh, you know, we're a very dog friendly, you know, anyone who loves uh, small animals and kids can't be all bad, right? That's the opposite of what W.C. Field said. Um, his name is on the door, Blue's name. Uh, he's, we call him a, a doggy canine specialist here. So... Um, really a big part of my pedo practice is that Talk dog. Talk about this because this is such a hot topic. You just got back from the ADA Roundtable uh, Airway Summit, Pediatric Air Summit. There was an ENT there, two pediatric dentists, three orthodontists, two myofunctional therapists, one pediatric psychologist, five GPs, and one prosthodontist, that was you, assembling the best experts in the world on airway. Now this, first of all, let's talk about why this subject was important and what was the purpose of this meeting. Yeah, it was a real honor to get an opportunity to be there. Um, Steve Carstensen, who practices up in Seattle, or outside, right outside of Seattle, and also runs the sleep course at Sphere Education, put it all together. He did an incredible job, which was actually interesting. Um, Steve really uh, was an air, was a sleep guy. He was an adult. I mean, he was kind of the fat old man that would. So anyway, it's I'm going to talk more about that, but I want to entertain you a little bit. So parents put the videos on YouTube. Louder, They're please. They're tiny children snoring. But today's study raises the question, could a pattern of noisy nights be linked to behavioral problems down the road, like attention deficit disorder, hyperactivity, and could any of it be prevented with a good night's sleep? Snoring is actually a red flag. It is a hallmark for problem breathing at night. Today's study followed more than 11,000 children for seven years. Those who snored <clears throat> breathed through their mouths or had apnea, long pauses between breaths, were up to twice as likely to develop behavioral problems by age seven. When this first came out in 2012, it was earth shattering. And now it's pretty much common knowledge, especially to this group. I won't ask you to raise your hands, but there's, there may be a few people in here that didn't know about this connection between a child's inability to breathe through the nose and have good quality cycling of sleep and the later risk for ADD, ADHD. Um, malocclusion is often comorbid with some of these behaviors that I'm going to develop over the course of the next hour. Um, that Last slide that I showed, that's Christian Gimeno, who just died. Um, he's the one who um, yesterday, Dr. Bergeson acknowledged as being really the person that really brought malocclusion uh, correction as being uh, somehow related to improved sleep and breathing and neurocognitive and neurobehavioral development. Um, and he did a lot to help me advance my career. 
uh, by really supporting uh, the protocol that, that we're doing in Chicago and similar to what they're doing at Stanford. Uh, we don't need to see that again, do we? Um, so anyway, assessing apnea, pre-apnea. You've heard of pre-diabetes, right? You've heard of uh, pre-hypertension. Well, pre-apnea. This is getting it before it turns into end-stage disease. And that can be as young as two and three years old. You have end-stage uh, nasorespiratory problems. Because if you're diagnosed with apnea and a, a AHI of one is significant in a child, not in an adult, uh, separate criteria. Um, I'm also, I guess you would call me an anthropologist in training. Um, I'll never complete a PhD, but I'm involved in postdoc research at Penn. I'm a visiting scholar at Penn. Um, I have to lay down some tools that may be boring, but you will, it'll come into play in understanding some of the concepts I'm going to develop with you. Um, has anyone here had an anthropology course or an evolutionary biology course uh, any time in their education? I mean, th this, this stuff in Northern and Western Europe is being taught in grade schools now. So we're, we're behind. Uh, and, and to think about oral and dental uh, and, and medical systemic problems, if you don't understand how natural selection works, um, you don't understand how a 1910 Model T turned into a 2019 Subaru Outback, okay? Natural selection guides the development of simple to complex in every aspect of life, especially in what we do. So understanding caries and malocclusion is what I'm, you know, I'm not gonna talk too much about caries, but I will talk about malocclusion. The term ontogeny just means from birth to death, okay? From conception to death. Um, the other term is phylogeny, and that is sort of the origin of a species to the present day, okay? So there's, there's things that develop and change uh, in response to environment and, and, and you, traits that, that will survive are the ones that help you get to the age of reproduction. It's called reproductive fitness. So one of the concepts that we develop is if I have a skull that's a thousand years old of a 30 year old that died, you know, a thousand years ago, and the, the thirds are fully erupted, the palate is flat, and the airway is big. Guess what I know about him at age two? He was perfect. Had to be. You can retrospectively do that. But if I come to a 30-year-old that dies in a car accident and his teeth are perfect, that just means he might have had, orthodont <laughs> might have had some good orthodontics. Okay? So, you know, it, it can be reversed, but not until about 150 years ago. Okay, so, so we know, this is five, look at some of your relatives there, uh, and anybody, you know, who might have a problem thinking that, you know, we're only a chromosome and a half away from chimpanzees six million years ago, um, it's true, and, and it's defensible, but it's in the anthropology literature, which we didn't get exposed to. Uh, these are some facts about malocclusion. Is it being a relatively new disease in uh, geological time frame? Um, it's a disease of civilization like type 2 diabetes is, uh, like lactose intolerance is. Uh, <clears throat> this is some, uh, a paper that is in press right now that um, Mariana Evans is an orthodontist. Anyone heard of Mariana Evans? Um, she's getting pretty famous. Uh, and she's a dual boarded perio orthodontist at Penn, and she's the one who really um, introduced me to the curator of the museum there, Dr. Janet Monge, and I got invited with her to be visiting scholar there. So we've been looking, she looks at adults, I look at kids, or what anthropologists call pre-adults, right? No thirds are erupted yet, that's a, that's a child. Uh, and that's what I've been studying for about seven years now uh, with Mariana. Um, we take comb beams on all those skulls, and uh, look at this, you know, impacted thirds. Go figure, it was in Origin of the, the Descent of Man by Charles Darwin, 1871. There's nothing new here, okay? I asked the question of an oral surgeon, is he here that spoke yesterday? Probably not, all the speakers usually go home after the first day. Um, but I asked him, why are third molars impacted? And he said, well, they could be teratoma. There's one hypothesis that says that they're teratomas, that they're like, you know, odontomas. Or, and uh, really, in all four corners, uh, and 
virtually everybody. Um, and there's a way to test that hypothesis. So I, but he was honest and I appreciated him telling me that because I didn't know that was floating out there. He did allude to the fact that maybe uh, environmental pressures are trying to select out of them. Well, guess what? We haven't needed third molars for the purpose of mastication, you know, survive of what we eat. We have to have these third molars. There's evidence that shows that there's a genesis of third molars even before we were considered anatomically modern humans, okay? So we haven't needed them for that. We need room for them. Anyone want to hazard a guess why we need room for wisdom teeth? Airway, right, you need room for them. That means that the tongue is up and forward and off the back of the airway during wakefulness and sleep. So we don't need wisdom teeth for mastication, but we need room for them. That's a hypothesis and it's testable. Um, any, any hypothesis must first be testable, refutable, and supportable. So I'm going to try to support our hypothesis that we're working on at Penn. And that is, if there's perfect dentition in the adult dentition, that means it was perfect from birth. And that means because you, you couldn't have survived childhood otherwise. And, and I'll develop that. Um, I uh, promoted this meeting at the Ancestral Health Society meeting, which is a group of anthropologists and physicians and dentists and um, people from all disciplines of healthcare that go to this. It's a great group. I advise you, this group especially, I think would resonate. Has anyone heard of the Ancestral Health Society? Raise your hand, anybody? No? Okay, well you have now. So you can raise your hand next time when somebody asks you. Um, and I am going to talk about cultural industrialization and westernization, diseases of civilization, you're all familiar with that. Um, but I'm going to be talking specifically about malocclusion. Um, this is my appointment letter as a visiting scholar at Penn. I'm very proud of that. Uh, finally in the Ivy League, right? So um, this is what I'm going to talk to you about today, uh, that jaws, faces are intimately connected uh, to the children's airway. The back of the face is the airway. The front of the airway is the face. Don't use the term craniofacial anymore, please. If I've done my job well, you will now all start saying craniofacial respiratory. The craniofacial respiratory complex. You could also call it the craniofacial auditory complex, the, the gustatory complex, taste. We have all these survival mechanisms. That's what they're called, you know, speech, hearing, vision, uh, you know, eating. All those things happen in the head. So we, we are in charge of a, a very important area of the body, as most of us, especially in this room, get it. Uh, ortho, orthodontics, orthopedics, orthotropics, dental facial orthopedics. Um, these are all things that they, they have to function well in very early childhood. If they don't, then things can go awry. It's like a tree growing crooked from a sapling. Um, very early childhood, two to six, all right? We thought we invented this protocol at Lurie Children's Hospital about 10 years ago. Guess what? It's been in the medical dental literature from the late 19th century through World War II. And that's when physicians and dentists, uh, they were called rhinologists, not ENTs, were collaborating on kids as young as two, 30 months old, to either adjunctively or just uh, solely expanding the arches to improve airway. Go, go, th you know, go figure, like that's controversial, right? Uh, it, it wasn't then, but it is now. Um, observational studies, you've all heard of evidence-based medicine, right? Prospective random controlled trials, blinded, right? And if it doesn't survive the rigors of that, oh, sorry, that's not evidence-based, you can't do that. Bullshit, okay? That is the biggest crock in the world. Um, does anybody know about E equals MC squared? All right, that wasn't a random control trial. How about penicillin? How about vitamin C and scurvy? How about the guy who observed the physicians leaving the cadaver room doing autopsies and going straight into delivering babies? Maybe we should wash our hands. That was an observational trial, okay? so. A well-designed observational study, and public health people have known this for decades, uh, is what drives evidence-based medicine. And look at this. Um, 
1912, the relief of nasal obstruction by orthodontia, a plea for early recognition and correction of faulty maxillary development. Look at that, 1912. I could talk about a hundred articles that I have located in my research of medical and dental literature that has been published since shortly after the end of the Civil War all the way up to World War II. And there's a reason for that time span being so precise. But th these were observational studies. Malocclusion has far-reaching effects. I'm not going to read all these for time, but the treatment of malocclusion should begin as early as possible, 30 months of age being considered the most favorable time. All right, Sam Cohen, MD. Uh, again, that's one essay, if you will. Um, but I can show you stacks, and I will send you people who want, like I need more evidence, even though it's observational. I'll send them to you. Uh, and that was from 1922, what I just showed. I'm, I'm expanding kids in both arches as young as two and a half years old. If they got 20 teeth, I can, with the, the, our, our forefathers in medicine dentistry, called spreading the arch. When you widen the palate, you widen the nasal cavity. Uh, <clears throat> John Walker is an orthodontist here from BU, and you want to know about the nose and what he knows about the nose. Uh, I learned so much. We went to dinner last night, and uh, it was pretty incredible. So there's a lot of resources uh, for us out there. I think the dental students and residents at BU are pretty lucky. And we've got, could you um, dental students and residents from BU and faculty, will you guys stand up so everyone knows you're here, please? Come on, do it. Look at that, huh? So I'm, um, I'm mentoring uh, some ortho residents that are they're doing their research with my data from my practice. They come to Chicago from Boston and get the data and then oh why well, I, I watched it yesterday and was shown what they're doing and it's finally you know I'm gonna get this data published uh, but I'm so I'm really proud of the dental students that are here and then there's uh, another uh, orthodontist from BU who's in actually got his faculty appointment in pediatric dentistry um, would you stand up sir uh, John, there he is, yeah. Look at that, an orthodontist with a faculty appointment in pediatric dentistry and is so, um, seemed very curious and intrigued and interested in what we're doing. Uh, so hopefully I'm gonna be working with him too. These are some of the appliances that we use. Uh, and, you know, again, everything is aimed at getting tongue space. That is the key. If anybody says you're treating too early or there's no crossbite, uh, why are you expanding a three-year-old? Because they need room for their tongue. Uh, and, I, and I will develop that. I put probably over half the children I treat, I treat as if I'm thinking they're going to turn into Jay Leno, is that I want that maxilla as far forward as I can get it. You, cannot ex you can't protract a kid too far. It just stops. There's a limit. You can overexpand, but you cannot overprotract. Uh, Marianne and Evans and I are both of the mind that we expand and protract as much as the, 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 the bones and, and muscles will allow. Uh, you must maximize tongue space at the earliest possible age. Tongue space, upward and forward off the back of the airway. This guy, E.A. Bogue, was a physician. Uh, he practiced in Chicago, New York, and Paris. Uh, did more research than anybody that I've ever seen on orthodontia in the primary dentition. And he came up with a number called the Bogue Index. And I'm gonna show you what that is, and I do it on every patient. Um, but these are some of his articles that he's written, he'd written. Um, this is the Bogue Index, and what it is, it's a metric between the mesolingual cusp at the, mar at the gingival junction in the maxillary arch, and it should be 28 millimeters by age four. There's other things. It's an index. It points. It's not diagnostic. Body mass index. It points to something. It's not diagnostic. It's indicative of his hypothesis, and he called it a hypothesis. Until some more sophisticated things come along, that's what he used to say. I found this on thousands of children to be very predictive. If this kid has not achieved 28 millimeters here by age four, they are growth restricted, and it will affect their airway. Um, and I've got several papers by him. His data is still at the Forsyth Institute around here somewhere, or it was up until 1950. It's probably gone now. Um, but I'm still trying to track it down. Um, and I use it, and I measure it. Now that kid right here, the Bogue Index, 
where do I go here? I cut it up right here, 27 and a half, okay? And that's a five-year-old, a six-year-old. So that's, you know, that's not enough. I and mean, I want more, really by the age of 10, I want them to be somewhere between 33 and 38. And I'll, you know, explain what that means, but it's indicative that there's tongue space there. Now, making room for the tongue isn't sometimes enough. They may have a tether, tongue tie, right? Not necessarily the kind at the end of the tongue. A lot of otolaryngologists, oh no, that's not a tongue tie. Yes, it is. If they have to close their jaw more than 50% to elevate their tongue to the roof of their mouth, even though the tongue tie isn't at the tip of the tongue, that's a tongue tie. It's significant. It's restricting movement of the tongue. And that can impair their breathing. Um, I'm doing these. Uh, that's a 500-year-old skull prior to the Industrial Revolution. And that number there is at about 38. And that is pretty much standard. We measure it at the second bicuspids. But if you get the, the, the primary molars, the maxillary second primary molars, to be in the mid-30s before it exfoliates, whether they're 6 or 10, that's going to stay that way all their lives if they have good tongue posture. And that's, that's, um, how, that's the contribution that he made. And I, I do that. You can do it on your Itero scans. Um, this is, it's a pivotal tooth. It's in the middle of the arch. So if this is right, most things in front of it, inner canine width is fine. Uh, Six-year molars uh, are, are fine. Those are ideal widths as well. But we just work as early in life as possible on those upper second primary molars. Um, canine blockage. This is another thing that's very informative. This is usually about seven and a half or eight millimeters wide. And you can see this kid will get taller after age six, seven, but this, that transverse growth will not happen. So we start expanding these kids and using that Bogue index. And then we spread out the front teeth and we consolidate that space and this canine space opens up. Do you know what that means if, if, a, if a five-year-old comes to you like that? Well, that tooth doesn't come until 12. Like, why don't you just wait till they're older? And that's what they're hearing from their orthodontist. Well, that means there's no tongue space now. Tongue space now. Okay, how about if the ophthalmologist told the parents of a four-year-old, your kid has myopia, nearsighted. Wait till he's driving a car. You know, you don't need glasses now. That means he has to have phase one glasses. Phase, we're going to burn them out on glasses, right? Would you, but, but yet we say all the time, save up your money for braces because it's 100% predictable. If you can't put a nickel between the baby teeth by age four, that kid is, doesn't have tongue space. So no, it's medically indefensible to tell a parent, save up your money for braces because the canines won't come in until 12. Okay, I, 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 I can't be more emphatic about that. Um, again, I do it on CAS, but this, it's a very important measurement. Okay, this is a little um, question, q and I'm doing Q&A at the beginning with you guys. Anyone want to hazard a guess? Just shout it out. If you dare, come on, somebody. Bingo. Now, yesterday, I asked the question about third molars, and there was a lady who was a speaker, Italian name. And she answered the question, who is she? Oh my God, that, I was like, I was sort of feigning that I didn't know the answer, and, but I didn't want to be a smart ass. But she was like, I guess she works with uh, Ferguson and stuff, but man, I was like so impressed with how she answered that question. Um, somebody please tell her I'm, I'm, a, I'm a fan. Um, so anyway, there's my uh, published reference. These are from flashcards that I bought at the Museum of Man in Paris. But uh, yeah, 250,000 years, that's how far back, and it's probably 300,000, that you could go back in time and mate with somebody and actually produce a viable offspring that could mate and have a baby. That defines a species. So we've been around a long time. Uh, so oral health, oral health. You know, and this is in your website, uh, the IOMT website. And look at all these things that are listed here. Is there anything missing? Anybody? How about malocclusion? That's the biggest public health nuisance. We call it oral and pharyngeal maldevelopments. Uma Katwa, who's head of pediatric sleep medicine at Boston Children's, 
who I'm going to be shadowing on Monday, he came up with that term maldevelopment, but it really means malocclusion phenotypes, okay? This is a big problem, but every time we talk about oral health, it's all centered around caries and gum disease and TMJ, and you know, it's important, right? But let's talk about malocclusion. Uh, it's, it's largely reversible and preventable. Who knew that, right? We don't even believe it about caries. Do you know human beings didn't have tooth decay appreciably till I'll tell you when later, but some of you probably already know it. Craniofacial respiratory complex. Look at this CPAP on, on uh, preemies. They're putting CPAPs on them. What's that going to do to the midface? You know, back of the face is the airway. All right, this stuff is, starts in utero. And this was talked about at the ADA. Does anybody know about the pediatric airway health con? There's been three of them, or there, the third one is coming up. The ADA is investing a lot of time and money in this. How am I doing on time here? Too. So I've got till when? 2.30? Till when? 2.30, yeah, don't say two. Oh my God. Um, so anyway, um, Stephen Sheldon is head of sleep medicine at Lurie Children's Hospital, and he and I have published two, published two book chapters on the type of orthodontic protocol that we are doing, IRB sanctioned, um, and what we've, for 10 years we've been doing this on kids. Um, I guess the, the ortho residents, some of the ortho residents at BU have looked at about 1,800 scans that we gave them that are paired with um, PSQ, pediatric sleep questionnaires. And we've got a whole bunch of projects that we think we can uh, develop from that. So we already did that. Um, here's what CPAP does. Now, this girl had sickle cell disease and uh, had emergencies, ad admissions, almost died a couple of times. Um, and the pressure kept being increased. She was up to like 12 or 14 millimeters. Uh, and we put her in a reverse pull face mask that still allowed enough seal and air to be blown into her airway to save her life, right? But it started to decrease. And look at what happened to her mid face, even while she was wearing CPAP. And look at what happened to her airway in terms of well, sorry about that. Come on. Okay, so the law of laminar flow in physics says that you affect radius, then you affect resistance. So it's an inverse relationship to the power of four, which means if I doubled, and it is, I tripled the size of this. Well, not me, but our team tripled the size of this. And that means that we cut resistance, you know, if you double it, cut it in half? No, two to the fourth power. 1 16th of what it was, all right? Tripled, 1 27th of what it was. So this is a very powerful thing. It works in the opposite direction as well. You can really mess up a kid's airway with retractive uh, orthodontic procedures. Um, this is what happens when you expand and protract a kid, is that the soft palate's connected to this, the adenoids are right here. You, de you increase the distance of the soft palate, which is the anterior wall, the nasopharynx and the oropharynx, you decrease that distance. Sometimes we don't even have to take ad adenoids out. I never tell anybody that. Like, if you do this, you won't have to have adenoidectomy. That's not my job. I'm a dentist. I, I do dentistry. I always collaborate with primary care pediatricians and, and work with them to get a otolaryngologist involved. Um, but this procedure, McNamara from the University of Michigan, showed in class three patients, white kids under the age of eight, that if you expanded and protracted them, is that this whole posterior, it's like counterclockwise growth, which uh, an image, you've all heard of a maxillomandibular advancement, right? Counterclockwise rotation, posterior nasal spine down forward and anterior nasal spine up and forward. This does the same thing. This is non-surgical MMA. And you can get in as young as two and a half years old and they don't have to have underbites to do this. There's a way to assess the maxillary position to the cranial base. So I'm gonna show a little bit of that later. Um, there's another way to advance the maxilla. Um, some of you, and sorry, I mean, close your eyes if you're gonna get grossed out after lunch, but um, you know, how about it? All right, wouldn't that be nice to do that in your kid before they turn to eight or seven? The American Association of Orthodontists wants to see a kid by age seven. Age seven is a geriatric patient in my practice, okay? I'm getting in way earlier than seven. Um, so anyway, MMA surgery, look at that. Now, it advances the maxilla, SNA, which I'll show that later, but those are the results I'm getting non-surgically. 
okay? And in our anthropology samples, you know, most of the, most of the specimens we have, their SNA is somewhere between 87 and 92. So that means that's our genomic potential. Um, our sample size is growing. We're getting specimens from other museums now uh, to show, you know, uh, currently used cephalometrics are not informed by anthropology at all. Um, so remember, the craniofacial complex, the respiratory system, the craniofacial respiratory complex. That's what it is. And it's in three textbooks now. Two of them are circulating around. Uh, the third one um, just came out, and I will send everybody PDFs of our chapters. Uh, so don't worry about that. I can send them to uh, uh, whoever, somebody here, central person. So the back of the face, the airway. The front of the airway is the face, and it starts very early. Age seven, and over here it says, according to this AAO brochure, that even though we'd like to see them by seven, we'll put them on observation. And usually we get started somewhere between nine and 12 or 14. I don't know what that is, but it's, it's old. Uh, and, and by then, a lot, and this is an updated version of it, and it's nine and 14. That's, that's when most kids get treatment. And they seem kind of proud of that, actually. I don't know. Um, so look at this. I found this on the IOMT website is that additionally, oral health problems in children can lead to attention deficits in, in school and dietary and sleep issues. That is, that is a head of the Academy of Pediatric Dentistry. They, they didn't show up to the round table because they said there's not enough evidence. So I'm really proud of this group and I will do anything I can to help you advance this agenda. Um, how could an oral health problem lead to ADD? Well, you must acknowledge there's something going on. It could be pain from untreated caries, I guess, and that keeps them awake. But no, it's comorbid malocclusion uh, traits. It's not class one, two, and three. There's all kinds of malocclusion traits that are often comorbid with behaviors that track with sleep-related breathing disorders. I don't say risk factors, they're comorbidities. And when you resolve one, you often impact the other. I'm a dentist, I'm just doing dentistry. Okay, I'm not saying I'm just a dentist, I, I, but I don't practice out of scope of practice. I don't say, I, I don't tell parents, I'm gonna cure your kid's bedwetting. I'm gonna, often those symptoms do go away when we do spread the arches and they get myofunctional therapy and they get their, their, their tethered tissue release. So, um, oral and pharyngeal maldevelopments, that's what it is. Now, safety, safety is another one of your pillars. Um, so, you know, again, when I first got this invitation, I thought, I don't know, like, do I fit in with this group? But I do. I really do. This is unsafe. The right time to orthodontic checkup, no later than seven. That is an unsafe procedure. By, by, that, that implies that you don't want to see them before, and you probably won't treat them until they're older. That is not safe for a child. And, and I can defend that. I think that's a medically indefensible position. And I'm currently in conversation with the editor of the uh, AJODO, Buzz Barrents, Ralph Barrents. He says I'm on a campaign to end the by age seven uh, policy. Well, I guess I am. <clears throat> so anyway, um, and what about this? Did, I wasn't here, I was at BU yesterday, but did anyone talk about this fluoride thing and toxicity to the fetus? Yes, good man. Well. It's, believe me, my feeling is, it's my kid, my wife is gonna be fluoride, like, you know, I saw that no fluoride in the water. I, di I didn't know how adamant you guys all were about that, but this seems to add support to your agenda, uh, I would say, at least in that area. Um, another word about random controlled trials. That study with the fluoride in pregnancy toxicity, that was an observational study, and JAMA sat on that paper for almost two years. They don't publish papers unless they're of really good quality evidence-based medicine, which implies double-blinded random control prospective trials, unless it's unethical to withhold a suspected, somewhat supported uh, therapeutic uh, regimen. Then they will publish an observational study. Okay, so this was an observational study and observational studies drive random controlled trials. So any one time, show me the, show me the evidence-based medicine. I'll show you evidence. Uh, it, it, people hide behind it. And people who think they're scientists, they're not, they're clinicians. 
And I'm, I'm just sort of ranting a little bit, but I'm, I've been exposed to it. Show me the random controlled trials. Um, I mean, show me the random controlled trial that says you should use infection control. Yeah, how about that? So, no, the, the <laughs> it's my favorite slide. These kids are trying to stay awake, okay? This behavior is that they get crappy sleep and they do anything they can to try to stay awake. Um, but anyway, the, the editor of the journal, Glick, I think at uh, General uh, American Dental Association said that um, there's never been a random controlled trial to see if infection control should be practiced in dental offices. We just do it uh, based upon observational data. Um, so anyway, um, I now, as part of my orthodontic workup, I want a mid-gestational ultrasound. Uh, and some of the, we, we want to see if this is predictive, uh, that, that there's an inferior facial angle that you can measure on, on fetuses at 21 months. They're looking for syndromes. But I want to do it with orthodontic patients that are coming in needing to have their jaws advanced by three or four years old. What did they look like at 21 weeks? And it's so far, we got a very small sample, but it's pretty impressive. Um, this evolutionary medicine, evolutionary uh, has been taught for almost 20, 25 years in some medical schools and, and more. There's not one dental school that has even shown interest in having this be part of the curriculum. I would like to propose at Boston University um, that if I put together a proposal to do a curriculum module in evolutionary oral medicine that, you know, maybe we could teach it here. I think uh, uh, some of the residents might be interested and I know John Walker would be. Um, this is uh, published in the journal Science. I was uh, amongst uh, 16 uh, uh, dentists and anthropologists that were invited to Duke University for three days, uh, sponsored by the National Science Foundation, to come up with solutions to the problem that anthropologists don't really understand clinical applications of their field work, and dentists don't understand how much they can, they can influence the anthropologists. So anthropologists need to influence dentists, and dentists need to influence anthropologists. I, uh, as a part of this, I've been invited all over the world to speak dentistry and anthropology departments and anthropology and dental departments. Um, Lieberman here in Boston, he's been a huge uh, inspiration to me. Uh, he was one of the first people to say that it was diet that probably led to the uh, first appearance of malocclusion around the time of the Industrial Revolution. And mismatch of our genome, We've you know, been around for 300,000 years and bingo, the Industrial Revolution and all of a sudden, malocclusion. Well, it has to do, we think, with women being the first skilled laborers in the textile mills. And they had to abandon 300,000 years of what we call ancestral patterns of nursing and weaning. There's more to it than that. I like, you know, I had to, oh, Dr. Boyd, you know, I, six kids going to you and I breastfed them all. What's that all about? Well, you didn't breastfeed like a Cro-Magnon, okay? That's a whole different pattern. And any amount of breastfeeding, guys should never, you know, I, I just, what, he's a guy, he doesn't know. So I won't really go off into it, but I'm, from a scientific perspective, I'm very interested in the, the patterns of nursing and weaning of our pre-industrial ancestors and what we can do now to sort of maybe recreate that. I, I think the only thing would be like robo breast that would, you know, deliver the same stimulation. And, but people are trying to come up with pacifiers and, you know, things like that. It, it ain't gonna happen. Uh, there's nothing, you know, uh, that even comes close to imitating what a woman can give to her child uh, and hopefully be supported uh, by uh, the father. Um, this just shows the, the first, um, and this is part of that, uh, focus group that I was part of at Duke. Um, I went to Durham University in Newcastle and spoke in the dental schools and the anthropology schools. It was like just a great experience. The first appearance of decay happens about 12,000 years ago because of agriculture. Is that in, in the Middle East around, you know, the Fertile Crescent, which is now Iran and, and around there. Um, that's when agriculture first started, and that's the first appearance of significant tooth decay in humans. Um, then the Industrial Revolution came along, and tooth decay got crazy, and malocclusion starts to appear. So um, this, I don't think it's going to play. Um, 
Yeah, it's not. Anyway, Randy Nessie is the person who sort of came up with the whole concept of evolutionary medicine. He's been sort of, his uncle was a NIH dental researcher, uh, and he's been very supportive of my efforts to try to get this into dentistry. Um, this just shows, um, you know, this is not a really great picture, but it shows the correlation of the width of the palate and the width of the posterior nasal aperture, or what they call the coana, and how narrow it is. And this is narrow, and you see caries. And um, so that's just sort of a real broad brush, but showing you first large scale uh, evidence of, of tooth decay is about 10,000. It even goes to 15,000 in some books that you read. But it wasn't until evidence, uh, events leading up to the Industrial Revolution that you first start to see malocclusion. And, you know, 300, 150, you, did, you see different things, but there just wasn't appreciable malocclusion, except in royalty, okay? Um, it was considered low class, or, you know, for it was beneath royalty to breastfeed. And, but the real reason was, um, when women are on-demand breastfeeding, it's very difficult for them to get pregnant. It's called uh, gestational amenorrhea uh, and lactation amenorrhea. And it's sort of um, royalty and gentry wanted a male heir. So they just get, you know, she, we don't want her, we want her to get pregnant right away. We just had a girl. We need a boy. We need a, you know, a, a king or a prince. But that is really one of the main hypotheses for why breastfeeding fell out of favor amongst the gentry, is because they wanted more offspring that hopefully produced a bunch of males rather than females. Sorry, it's misogynistic, but that's the way it, that's the way it went. Um, <clears throat> anyway, um, I take a cone beam on every patient, and you heard Dr. Miles this morning, that's why I asked him that question is that the radiate, it's, it's defensible, it's medically defensible, and there could be evidence even that low dose radiation could be protective in some cases. Uh, so I'd never heard that one before, but he is indeed an authority. Um, these are just, this is before I had a cone beam. Um, this is a child who I treated in the early 90s, and she walked into my office when she was like, I don't know, 30, and I could tell by her face, and it was just when I was getting into airway, and I said, can I take your x-ray? And sure enough, uh, she just, you know, it, it, it was, I wish I had a cone beam on her now, if she ever walks in again. Um, but, you know, this is a narrow at the nasal, uh, oral nasal pharynx. This is down at the hypo or laryngeal pharynx. Um, vertical growth, I mean, there's so many things that you can pick up even on a two-dimensional x-ray. Um, this is sort of a rendition of a Cro-Magnon that I put over that patient of mine, and it's very similar. Uh, it's not terribly scientific, but that was something that uh, was very impressive. Um, according to the Academy of Pediatric Dentistry, you pedodontists, you can't answer. When should the first dental visit be? Anybody? Age one, you bet. Um, and, you know, assess oral health. They're not, the, the Academy is still not saying assess airway health risk and malocclusion risk, but they're, they're coming along. We're trying to push it a little bit. Um, you know, 30 months of age, again, I can't stress this enough. I just, and I, anyone who wants this paper, and it's just one paper and it's observational, but I've got a stack of papers that support this, uh, that, are, that predate World War II. Um, this is a two-year-old. I do this all the time, routinely. Look how tiny these appliances are. And they do great. If the parents are into it, the kid just wants to please. Most kids do. Um, and that is normal, doesn't necessarily mean healthy. It means averaged amongst a given population. Um, and the norms are, are all so, sort of uh, based upon non-anthropologic uh, samples. Um, anybody? I don't know why this isn't. Come on. Oh, well, yeah, it's all of the above. When does it start? Okay, so this has been going on for 100 years. I'd like to um, show some of these papers that support it. Um, that I'm not going to, that, that's going to take too much time, but that's our sample at the uh, Penn Museum and the curator, Dr. Monge. Um, that's Mariana Evans. We take the skulls out of her 
uh, out of the museum and we take them to her office in, in Philadelphia. Got 10 more minutes. Um, we have found that virtually, and this is uh, it's called A point to N perpendicular. Um, you know what that is, you orthodontist. But you drop a perpendicular from the junction of the forehead to the nose to Frankfurt horizontal, A point virtually 100% of the skulls that we have looked at that are over 200 years old, the A point is always in front of that line. McNamara said that it, um, if it's on that line, um, it's okay. We say it's gotta be ahead of that line, but he found the majority of his sample, class two patients were not only uh, mandibular retrusive, 100% of them, but the vast majority of them were also maxillary retrusive. And this is one of the metrics he used to show that, and that really surprised him. So when you're looking at class twos, and I'm putting a class two in a face mask, I make the class two worse on purpose, because you are limited how far you can bring a mandible based upon where the anterior position is of the maxilla. So, you know, you got a kid back here and the maxilla's here, you can only go there and you need to go here. So you got to do this first. And it looks beautiful, the, the, the aesthetic results are incredible. But when you have parents coming to you saying, oh my God, he quit bedwetting. You know, I used to hear that when I correct crossbites and didn't believe it. I'd just say, if you say so. But uh, you can mitigate a lot of um, breathing symptoms on kids and sleep problems by doing If you this. could pack all of human history into one year, we've only been farming and eating grain since about yesterday, which is when we became shorter and fatter. We only started consuming processed vegetable oils about 10 minutes ago, which is when heart disease became our number one killer. So after examining all this human history, the experts came to the obvious conclusion. All right, so I can't take you all through that, but not only shorter and fatter, but the jaws got narrower and, and um, they got more retrusive and they got more vertical. Okay, so um, this is kind of just important to know. Um, our faces used to be forward and they didn't look bad. In fact, you've heard of cave people like Cro-Magnons. They were beautiful people. They can put skin on them now. They were not uh, unattractive by any stretch of the imagination by today's standards. Um, so I'm gonna play this real quick. The last major milestone in the seven million years of hominid evolution is the emergence of modern humans or homo sapiens, people who for the first time fundamentally looked and behaved like us. While a date of around 200,000 years ago was frequently given for this dynamic, there is still substantial debate regarding the timing as something that was an ongoing process rather than a single point in geological time. Anatomically, it is widely recognized that facial size reduction or gracilization or feminization as it is sometimes called, as well as facial retraction are key defining traits for our species. So facial retraction and this is from 1881, a cause of lessened pronathism. And it has to do with cultural industrialization. And here they talk about um, wisdom teeth tending to become rudimentary, whereas they never were. A big part of orthodontic training was anthropology. What was considered a normal occlusion was based upon a pre-industrial sample. Um, again, I don't have time to go into all that, but we can talk. These are things that crowd the airway. Obviously, big adenoids, everybody knows about that. But fat deposition on kids who are overweight in the lateral pharyngeal walls, the base of the tongue and the soft palate, and skeletal retrusion. It pushes, that crowds the airway. So pharyngeal crowding is a new term you're going to be hearing a lot more about, and it isn't just tonsils and adenoids. Um, these are some cases I'm going to show. Um, retronathic, but her maxilla was also back. Not too bad, huh? And there, the parents were ecstatic because so many of her symptoms disappeared as we brought that forward. And that's her airway. And again, what did Dale Miles say? It is um, uh, selective product, selective features. You can select features out. It's not really um, CAT scans. That, you know, they call them cone beam. You know computerized tomography, but it's, it's, you can select out these images. And I, his lecture was great. You should uh, consult his website. He's a brilliant guy. Um, so anyway, um, this is just some of the things um, that evolution is a, is a basic science for medicine. Well, it should be a basic science for us, too. Um, and I, B-movie, if anyone saw that, The Incredible Shrinking Man. 
but I adapted this for a talk I gave at Penn on uh, the shrinking face. Um, so maxillary retrusion occurs in which angle classification? Anybody? All of the above, absolutely. Um, I'm going to try to go fast here. This is McNamara where he showed that the vast majority of uh, class two patients are actually not only mandibular retrusive but maxillary retrusive. And this is, you know, any plastic surgeon that plans for an ideal result always has a wide and forward face. Uh, sorry, got that again. Um, I came up with something called class four malocclusion, a new angle, and that is the typical uh, class two mandible and the typical class three maxilla. And that's what most Caucasian and in, in industrial societies are class, some degree of class four, by maxillary retrusive. You may not need an MMA, but most people growing up in industrialized societies do not have, uh, and, it, and I've seen it in the literature that they talk about class two by maxillary retrusion. Um, we already talked about Dr. Bogue. Sorry about that. I meant to take that out. Um, and I, I do, I go in journals, and I, so it isn't just my own, but look at that, 38 millimeters, you know, 28 by age four, right? Well, we know that that person probably had to have been at least 28 by age four. They wouldn't have survived childhood. That's a testable hypothesis. Um, <clears throat> We did that. Here's some more cases we're talking about. Anterior open bite. All right. We what? Look at look at how much wider he got. There's his airway, and then he had an adenoidectomy. So, big deal. Didn't that do it? Does anyone know about the recurrence of symptoms after uh, TNA surgery? It's about 60%. The kids will suffer. They will get better for a while. And some kids sometimes are cured, not that much. So we say this is an, at least an adjunctive procedure, that if kids are going to get a TNA, also expand and protract them, and you'll have less likely uh, of, of relapse. So look at this. These are, you know, I'm sorry about the lighting. You can't see it. But these are people that sleep on their shoulders. And they have to sit, look at his, his mouth and nose. And they sleep like that all night. This is in South Africa. So still in quiet, even if you want, don't want to go through the whole pediatric sleep questionnaire and ask 24 questions, you can ask, is your child still in quiet or don't you know? You're still doing a service. If you're a prosthodontist who only sees adults or a general dentist who only sees adults, that adult in your chair with their TMJ, with their worn restorations, they could be a first or second order relative of a little kid and you may be the person to identify it by saying, you know what? You obviously have some airway issues. Do you know that your grandchild might be, be, be predisposed to this? You might actually indirectly really change a kid's life, just even if you don't see adults. Uh, so I was um, hoping there, were, there was a prosthodontist that was out on the floor. I told him to come in, but I don't know if he's here. So there's something here for everybody. You're an endodontist, periodontist, you don't see kids. You still can take part in this whole mission. We think this is gonna be as big as penicillin. We really do. That sounds hyperbolic, but uh, penicillin started out as being something really expensive and, and experimental. World War II came, testing got done, and now you can get it like candy. I mean, it's, it's available to everybody. Well, this is not available to everybody. It's parents who have resources that can afford orthodontics. That's got to change, and I think Dr. Bergeson's uh, model uh, is so simple and probably less expensive that we can get this to, and I'm going to pay a, you know, I'm not endorsing any product, but I'm going to pay a lot more attention uh, to the Healthy Start program. I don't use it now. Um, here's another one of my patients, airway, again, two-dimensional, but the color says that it's collapsed. It's like an ellipse. Uh, this is just from some expansion. I didn't even put her in protraction, and her mandible she just really shot forward. Uh, and all of her symptoms, look at all these positives on the PSQ, and they're all nose now. Um, this is my metric, and this is the last thing that I'm going to have time to talk about. And it's going around the room. And you can get this if you call um, 
someone from the Dawson Academy is helping coordinate this because they helped me uh, build this, but you can use it chair side. And these are all validated symptoms or, or physical traits that, that are often comorbid with sleep-related breathing disorders. Um, I'm not going to go through these questions because we've got to get through all these. And I'm going to go through it fast, but again, um, I can even send you a PowerPoint with all these, and you can use it chair side. And it's good to give to your, uh, you know, if you're seeing kids, give it to the PCP, the primary uh, pedi pediatrician. Um, and I, sorry, I, I thought I was going to have more time, and I don't, so I'm going to go fast. Uh, bruxism, obese, overweight, highly vaulted palate, eye appearance. We have scleral show. You shouldn't see the whites of the eyes, right, when a kid's looking straight ahead and the venous pooling under the eyes, uh, anterior open bite, retronathia of the mandible and the maxilla. Uh, tongue tie, and now we have deviated septum, so it's Chicago Hearts, and it's it's being revised. Um, also, there, there's a lot of problems now uh, with doing TNA on kids younger than three. There could be neurotoxicity, um, so we, we have to come up with alternatives to TNA surgery as being the gold standard for this. Um, and I'm not going to have time for that. Did that? Uh, yeah, S. That was a deviated septum. We're putting that in there now too. Gonial angle. That should be under 130 degrees. I do a whole. I mean, we're doing a course in Chicago at the end of January, and we're going to be doing, you know, just um, theoretical stuff. And then there's going to be advanced hands-on where we're going to teach people how to how to trace these cefts. Uh, sorry again. We're repeating here. Look at the title, Enlargement of the Nasal Sinuses in Young Children, 1909. 30 months of age. Again, can't really... I'm so sorry. I don't know how these got in here. No. Oh, well. This is um, the database for cephalometrics from Case Western University. And it's, this is where a face should be. It's based on a sample of kids who didn't need orthodontics from 1931 to 1950. And we do this on every patient to show parents where kids' faces should be. Um, normal, what does normal mean? And normal comes from anthropology. That's what they used to use. We got away from that. Um, and we got kids as young as, well, fetuses from the, that you know were still born 500 years ago. They're born with their jaws forward. And what we're seeing, uh, on ultrasounds, um, look at that. I mean, look at the difference, and that's that's pretty typical. I mean, if, if you look at your own kids' gestational ultrasounds, um, and we used to think that it was sort of natural for. Uh, have they been proved to be safe, Mr. Cullman? I believe they have not been proved to be unsafe because when, as, and if any ingredient in cigarette smoke is identified as being injurious to human health. We are confident that we can eliminate that ingredient. And I concluded from that report... It's true. The babies born from women who smoke are smaller, but they're just as healthy as the babies born from women who do not smoke. What about the higher and rate some women would prefer having smaller babies. Out. No, and, and look at... Winston advertised it. Talk about a win-win. Look at that. Easy labor, slim baby, full flavor of Winston's, huh? <laughs> So that's all I got for you. Uh, you know, so time for a few questions, I guess. Huh? Yeah. I wouldn't miss it for anything. And the Hippocratic Oath, right? Do no retraction, do not delay treatment. Okay, so thank you, thank you.